Janae Solomon, owner of the National Negro Opera House. When I first saw the Opera House, I did not know what it was. There was a historical landmark plaque in front of the house, and I thought that was interesting. But when I asked people in Pittsburgh if they knew about the house, no one actually knew about the house. They didn't know it existed, and they did not know it was in Pittsburgh. And that's when I decided to purchase the house with uh, Miriam White and restore the house. The house was an access point for artists, um, stealers, the pirates, and all sports people that were African American because they were not able to stay anywhere else. So that was the first main important point. It was an access point for people. Secondly, it was a school of music started by Mary Codwell Dawson. And then Mary Codwell Dawson started the National Negro Opera Company to give anyone who wanted a chance to be on a main stage that opportunity. She did something in a time where doing anything as a woman, as a black person, and as a person with no means was very difficult. And she was able to achieve that in that time. And my main point was if she can do it then with much less than I have today, there's absolutely no reason that I cannot do more. That was really the inspiration. Mary Codwell Dawson started a 100 piece choir here in Pittsburgh and they performed where PNC Park is today. She also gave people a chance to create a production where not only does she have singers on stage, but people were able to be makeup artists who weren't makeup artists before. People were able to be costume designers who were not costume designers before. And she was one of the first people to allow someone to put a live animal on stage. She had an elephant on stage at the Syria Mosque and she gave that person that creative freedom um, when people weren't even, you know, in the room. So that was inspiring. The biggest hurdle we encountered is building a team of advocates and building awareness. It seems that it doesn't matter how many newspaper articles, how many interviews, I can literally speak until my mouth is dry and still no one knows that this exists. No one knows it's important and we're just not getting the support. So that's the biggest hurdle, building awareness. Our plans for the future is to restore the National Negro Opera House in order to finish the bridge that Mary Cardwell Dawson started to give people access to a main stage. To help or donate, people can go to our website, nationaloperahouse.org, to email us for more information or make a donation. It was more like Cab Calloway. Roberto Clemente, Lena Horn, Ahmad Jamal. Sarah Vaughn, she would come into Pittsburgh, she would stay there. If the walls of that house could talk. Oh, they would talk all day long. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Now that would be wonderful. Barbara Lee lives in a nursing home now and needs oxygen around the clock. My nephew is in her wheelchair, she passes the rooms of others, where inside, Memories are fading, but not Barbara's, especially her memories of a place just a few miles away, 7101 Apple Street. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We had a glorious time in that house. It was gorgeous. Stained glass windows. But those windows were broken or stolen long ago. And up on the third floor was the ballroom, uh, dancing. And all signs of life are long gone. It was quite a showpiece, and it could be again. Barbara Lee hopes so. She has a special connection to this grand old Victorian, which sits on the border of Pittsburgh's Homewood and Lincoln-Lemington neighborhoods. Many Pittsburghers don't know it. 
that the National Negro Opera Company started in this house. Even fewer know the story of the woman who founded it, Barbara's aunt, Mary Cardwell Dawson. I was at Mary's secretary, her confidant. I traveled with her. And it was quite a journey for Mary Cardwell Dawson during an era when few African Americans had access to opera and classical music training, this woman would teach and inspire generations. Oh, Aunt Mary was delightful. She was quite a musician. She um, could do it all. Mary Cardwell was raised in Munhall, but had to leave the Pittsburgh area to further her dream of a musical education. She couldn't get into Pitt, so she had to go to New England to get into a, a university. By 1925, Mary had degrees in piano and voice from the New England Conservatory. She later studied in Chicago, New York, and hoped for a career in opera. She was a singer, an impresario. But America wasn't ready for a black opera singer. Mary would have to pass her dream down to others. She used to say all the time, the richest child is poor without a musical education. So Mary Cardwell Dawson taught. Her school of music boasted an impressive faculty and trained hundreds of young African Americans, first on Frankstown Avenue, then later Apple Street. Students came from all over Western Pennsylvania to learn from Madame Dawson. She stood barely five feet tall in high heels, but had a bigger than life reputation. Oh, tough. She was a hard taskmaster that everybody would tell you that. She got their results. In the 1930s, she formed the Cardwell Dawson Choir, getting rave reviews wherever they performed. The critics, they loved her. If Mary Cardwell Dawson sent out a choir, it was a choir. Along with the awards came a prestigious invitation to perform at the 1939 New York World's Fair. And she was elected president of the National Association of Negro Musicians. Her reputation was all over the country, you see. Talented, smart, and charming, Mary spent years networking, holding fundraisers, selling tickets. Her devoted husband, Walter, pitched in too. His salary as a master electrician and Mary's drive kept the music going. In 1941, Madame Mary Cardwell Dawson took that music to a new level. She founded the National Negro Opera Company, opening new doors behind this third floor window in Pittsburgh. Many of her students went on to really do fine things, you know. Ahmed Jamal, now he was one of Aunt Mary's pupils. Bobby McFerrin, he was the first black male to sing at the Metropolitan Opera House. Madame Dawson worked with pioneering soprano La Julia Ray, who was the National Negro Opera Company's first Aida. Mary mentored Napoleon Reed, a former stockyard worker who later went on to Broadway. The opera company expanded with chapters in Chicago, New York, and Washington. Here's a photo of Mary with Richard Nixon in 1955. This is a check to the opera company signed by Eleanor Roosevelt. And as Mary's national reputation grew, the house on Apple Street remained a beacon in the black community of Pittsburgh. Anything that was going on for the community, it kicked off there. There would be some great deals, great business deals done there. The, the entertainment there was first class. 
John Brewer is a Pittsburgh historian now piecing together the legacy of this old house. And it's a legacy dating back to 1894. The first owner on record, George Schaefer. Much more, though, is known from 1930 on, when William Woogie Harris bought the house. Harris would partner with another well-connected businessman, Gus Greenlee, using the home to host high society. And with the famous or infamous always coming and going, the house earned the nickname Mystery Manor. It was a mystery. It was an enigma to many people who, who lived in that area. It's seated up rather high, so therefore you, you get the feeling of royalty when you walk around that house. Harris and Greenlee were like royalty in the community, and they kept the house humming with social events, benefits, and parties. Woogie Harris and Gus Greenlee were in fact the bank of the black community. I guess the proper word would be digitarians. Woogie Harris was in fact a numbers man, as was Gus Greenlee. They, they were the driving force behind the clubs. They, they were the driving force behind the Negro baseball teams. Greenlee's wife, Mamie, opened a top shelf tea room in the house and Mystery Manor welcomed people who weren't welcome elsewhere. The hotels were segregated. There were always very prominent people coming in town. People like Lena Horn, Joe Lewis, and Roberto Clemente. The house became a refuge for African-American artists and for professionals who were not able to get accommodations at, at the hotels. There's no other place in this Homewood Brushton district that has that kind of richness, that kind of history. As I was just driving by one day, I saw the plaque, got out of my car, read the plaque, and I was amazed that something like this was in Pittsburgh. But by now, the surrounding neighborhood was not what it once was. On Apple Street, owners had come and gone. The house was empty when Janae Solomon bought it from the bank in 2000, along with a friend, Miriam White. They paid $18,000 with hopes of raising more money to reopen as a community center with another music school and tea room. Starting a nonprofit, running a nonprofit, and it's a huge task. It's, it's a lot bigger than I thought it was. Among the challenges, potential investors had little or no knowledge of the history here. Previous owners had sectioned the house into apartments, removed the grand staircase, sold most of the original fixtures. With no money for improvements, high hopes have turned into frustration. It's even been suggested that we tear it down and rebuild. A huge loss for Pittsburgh, a huge loss. I never think that thought. I always think of what can we do to keep this house standing? And it's still here, so it's still possible. <laughs>